just come out of a, a time of fasting, and I want to thank all of you who fasted with us, who prayed with us for the month of February. It really was a great time of just seeking the Lord's face and, and being encouraged in the Spirit. And sort of in the, the middle of this time, I had a, a conversation with my daughter, sort of right at the start, the beginning of February, and um, in class with them, their one teacher, they do sort of Bible study in school, and they'd read a passage which we're going to look at this morning, and it stimulated a bunch of conversations because she was all excited about, you know, all of these things that are going to happen before Jesus comes back. And one night in bed, we sat and we spoke through them a little bit, and it, it challenged my heart, and it encouraged me at the same time because as we're going to read this bit, I, I think we're going to perhaps see that Jesus said some uncomfortable things. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, that as you read Scripture, Jesus always isn't the kind of the politician thinking about how best can I spin this truth. Often when he speaks, he speaks almost in abrasive ways. There are many times when after he has spoken, we know that people decided not to follow him anymore. And so we're going to, with that as a little bit of a background, we're going to look hopefully honestly and a little bit encouragingly at the words of Jesus, how when he speaks these truths to us, they're not always the nicest words to hear, but they do bring an incredible amount of comfort because of the truth that they hold. And so Jesus speaks, we're reading from Matthew chapter 24. So later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and they said, tell us when will all of this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? I guess that's a question that kind of we all wrestle with from a small age. When is this whole thing going to end? And before we look at that sign, just a, a couple of things that I'd like to remind us about. And the first one, and often, perhaps not you, but I, I find myself forgetting this. Jesus is coming. That's sort of, if we take nothing else away from this message, this encouragement today, it is that Jesus is coming back. That day will come. It could be now, or maybe now, maybe now, or tomorrow, or next week, or next month, or next year. It could be another thousand years. It could be next second. We, we don't know. But at some stage, He promised He is coming. And that carries such a large part of the, the hope in our heart. Many parts of the early church, their greeting to one another would be Maranatha meaning our Lord Jesus, come. It's an expectation that they would share with one another. Jesus is coming. And I wonder, sort of, if you were to look at the last week in your life, how often, how much of our life had at its center of our decision-making, of our thinking, of our action, of our activity, Jesus is coming. A part of me wants to live in a way where I'm always scanning the horizon. My eyes are always on the sky for, I want to see, I want to glimpse that moment when He comes. Scripture is pretty clear, we're not going to miss it. But, but I want to have that expectation in my heart that Jesus is coming. My eyes longing for that moment when He comes down on the clouds in whichever way specifically it's going to be, that moment when He descends from heaven again, that expectation in my heart. I wonder what our lives would look like if we had this as part of our greeting as we saw one another and we said to each other sort of, instead of hello, there's nothing wrong with hello, nothing wrong with good morning, but Jesus is coming. And we sort of started our conversation and the early church had that as a form of habit. It's not right, it's not wrong, it's not theology to must do it that way, mustn't do it that way. But I think there's something precious in that expectation that we're always reminding ourselves, Christ is coming. He is returning. And I want to warn you, as I said just now, perhaps I, I should have made a little image. You know when you watch a movie, I don't know, there's some very holy people who don't watch movies, but us unholy people, sometimes when you watch a movie, there's a little triangle that appears beforehand, and it says, warning, parental guidance is advised, or whatever it may be. Now this message is, not parental guidance is advised, but just warning, uncomfortable words ahead. Warning, everything in here isn't going to be warm and fuzzy, and I can't wait for that moment. 
unless the Holy Spirit does something really precious in our hearts around an expectation for that moment. So they've come. They said, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. He's been speaking sort of to the masses about the end that is coming. I'm going to be speaking about the end times a little bit today. I never thought I'd preach about the end times today. Sometimes we have to. A couple of years ago, every second sermon was about the end times. And so Jesus is sitting there, and his disciples come to him in private, and they say, Jesus, talk to us about this end of the world thing. What, what is it going to look like? What's going to happen? So Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. And so I want us to pause there, and if you had to write down your expectation for what you think your life and your world is going to look like for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I wonder how many of us write in our expectation, chaos. I expect my world to be turned upside down. Once again, I want to put this disclaimer in here. We don't know when this is going to happen. It could be that this happens after our lifetimes. It could be an it would be pretty amazing, just on a per- totally selfish level, if for the rest of my time here on earth, everything is peaceful and beautiful and shops just work and, you know, no one drives a tank down my driveway of my house. It would be pretty amazing. It would be amazing if I, it's just easy and comfortable as we've been in a sense the last 15 or 20 years or so. It might very well be that. But what if it isn't? Because at some stage, the clock is going to tick over and stuff is going to begin to change. And then it is so important that we have a healthy view of what is going on. So I want us to look at this passage just a little bit. Just helping God, or asking God, trusting that God would help us frame a healthy expectation for a season that is coming. I don't know when that season is. And this is kind of one of those weird moments, I guess, in in most of our hearts. I was speaking to a guy during the week and speaking about wars and all of these things and, you know, the real danger of nuclear war, which we trust and hope is never going to happen. But the reality is we're as close now as we've possibly ever been in human history. And so talking to this guy about this, just actually a... Another crazy story, but a random type of guy and got into really great, really deep conversations and he asked me how I feel about all of this stuff and if a war thing would come here and I said, I don't, I'm not afraid of dying. You can't threaten a Christian with heaven. I'm afraid of the not dying in the sense that the reality of the heartache and the pain and the hurt that remains, that, that is real, but the dying part is the easy part. David Crowder wrote this beautiful song, and he he says, everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And so this is one of those things. All of us want Jesus to come back, but none of us want the pain that's happening beforehand. And so I really, really want to be in heaven. But at least for now, I really, really don't want to die yet. I really, really want Jesus to come back. But I really, really don't want wars and threats and rumors of wars and nations rising up against nation, except they go hand in hand. I guess in a sense, Jesus is saying for us that we should have an expectation that there will be a time when things are going to get a heck of a lot harder before they get better. When life is going to be a lot worse before it gets a lot better. And as I said, these aren't comfortable words. These aren't necessarily the words that are going to get us out here shining and jumping up and down and saying, yes, Jesus is coming. Because we know, yes, Jesus is coming. But that also means there's a lot of pain and heartache 
and hurt that is coming. So he says, many are going to come and they're going to deceive us. And obviously that's true. And I'm not knocking any of that. We're just today not going to focus on, in a sense, the spiritual side, which is very, very, very important. Jesus starts with that. It's not, not important. But I want us to focus on something a little bit else this morning. He says, you will hear of wars, threats of wars. Can I put this in here? But don't panic. Don't panic. Even right now, there are wars and there are threats of wars and more wars, just as a, one example. But don't panic. These things, because look what he says here. Yes, these things must take place. And here, once again, in my prayer life, I'm, I'm caught sort of in these two things. God, this must happen. In other words, it's probably not too much that I can do to not make it happen. These wars, these rumors of wars, these nations rising up against nation, this is going to happen whether I pray and fast about it or not. Jesus says these things must happen, but don't panic. Don't panic. Keep focused on Christ is coming. Yes, there's going to be a heartache, there's going to be pain. And then perhaps maybe throw this in there as well, because Jesus puts it there for us. In a sense, he don't, don't worry. That is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. Perhaps while my mind's on that right now, I just want to pause. Within this week, we'll send out on the WhatsApp updates group as well as some of our social media. We've got great friends in the Ukraine. Bible-believing, God-fearing, spirit-led brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing incredible work, and many of our churches have over the years sent missions teams there. One of our elders at one of our other churches, and he's sort of beyond retirement age. He's the type, his children are at retirement age now. He spent many, many years in his life planting churches in Ukraine, and through that, we've got great relationship with these churches, and we want to support them, and one way we can support them is by praying for those churches, but we can also obviously support them financially, just in the midst of the chaos where they are, so if anybody wants to, within this week, we'll have all of that information available for you should you wish to support um, the church activity in Ukraine. And just basic supplies, obviously life is, I guess, as close to hell on earth as it can be for those guys right now. Nation will go to war against nation. And Jesus says, this is just the beginning. And my question, I guess, this morning for us is, are we prepared? Are we as the church prepared and as God was just encouraging me all of the time through the fast, and you'll hear this a lot from my mouth the last while when I speak about the church because it's important that we hear this. When we say, is the church prepared? We're not saying, is some distant group, is a set of programs prepared? Is some disconnected body? No. Is the church prepared? The question we're asking is, are you prepared? Am I prepared? Is the person sitting next to me prepared? I wonder what we would do. And I really, really hope this never comes to pass, except Jesus says it might just. I wonder what we would do if we were sitting here in church and a bunch of tanks started driving, not friendly tanks, hostile tanks, after shelling us for a couple of days, drove in here from the highway up the N4. I wonder what our faith response would be in that moment, would we be prepared for what Jesus says must come? I hope and pray, as I said, in one part of my life, not in my lifetime, but I also hope and pray in my lifetime because I want Jesus to come back. And, and that's this, this challenge that I guess we all wrestle with. Someday the clock is going to tick over and things are going to turn. And what then? Are you prepared? Am I prepared? Is our worldview prepared? Is my faith prepared? Is my expectation of God in that situation prepared? These things are going to happen. Whether we like it or not, Jesus said they must take place. And so when I read a passage like this, the first thing I want to do is, God, don't let kingdom rise against kingdom and don't let nation rise against nation. And as I'm praying for Ukraine, that's exactly what I'm praying. But I also know there's going to be a time where I'm going to be praying that and God is just going to say, no. It must happen. Philip, right now, you are praying the wrong prayer. What needs to happen here now, 
for the kingdom of God, God to advance, for my purposes to come, is this nation must rise against this nation. And that's challenging because the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called sons of God. I want to be a peacemaker. And yet sometimes God says, there will be wars and threats of war. I saw this great Instagram post just in this week as well as I was preparing. It was sort of right in season. And Louis Giglio, many of us know his ministry. He says, given the current state of affairs and the scriptures, we need less preaching on how God wants us to avoid suffering and more preaching on how God wants to empower us to endure suffering well. This is what I'm speaking about here within this context is one form of suffering. I wonder if we were in Ukraine today, if we were in one of those cities that have been surrounded by hostile forces, rightly or wrongly, that's far less the point this morning, that I'm in a city that is being besieged and being bombed. What does my prayer look like in that moment? What does my faith ask of me to do in that moment? What is my expectation of God in that moment? It's very easy to say that will never happen. I'm just going to pray and God's going to put an iron dome over my city and the bombs are never going to fall. Except I'm pretty sure there were some people in Kiev who were praying those prayers and the bombs are falling. And they trust in God. And now the question is, okay, God, what now? Who are you, God, in this moment? How do I represent you in this moment? Because this moment looks different to the moment before. My season has changed. My environment has changed. But God, you have not changed. And so how are we prepared for those moments? How are we prepared to embrace, to endure suffering? Well, there are very many types, different types of suffering. Our suffering might not be tanks driving on our own. Our suffering might look different. But how do we embrace seasons of suffering? So Jesus said all of that. Here's the encouraging bit. That's just the beginning. So if you really want to cheer somebody up in Kiev right now, phone them, send them a WhatsApp and say, hey, I hear it is almost hell on earth right now, but I've got good news for you. It's just the beginning. It's just starting. Because then Jesus carries on and kind of we move up in a sense to level two. He says, that's just the beginning. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. Many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. In other words, lawlessness is actually the word that's used there, just the unwillingness to yield to authority, starting with God's authority. And the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this bit we all love. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the world so that all the nations will hear hear it. And then the end will come. And so God says these wars, these rumors of war, you know, that's all going to be really hard. That's just the beginning because when we get to level two, when it escalates, it's going to become personal. Some of us have been hated. Some of us have been ostracized. Some of us have been, you know, pushed aside a little bit for beliefs, for decisions, for whatever it may be. Jesus says that's only going to get worse. And it's not even because we've done anything wrong. It's not going to be because we're bad people, because we're unloving people. Simply the defining characteristic that's going to make people hate us is we love Jesus. Doesn't that sound exciting? I told you, uncomfortable words ahead. There's going to come a time. Fortunately, I thank God. And once again, it's this incredible tension. I thank God we're not in there. I thank God right now that on the whole, people appreciate us because we love Jesus. If we walk to somebody, if we speak to the hospital next door and we ask them to use their parking, okay, great, you guys love Jesus. You're good people. We'll let you use it. There's a time coming where it will be, oh, you love Jesus? No ways you're coming close to us. A little bit, 
like we see certain sections of this society. We talk about thought crimes. You think different to me, and because you think different, believe different, hope different, you are allowed, not allowed to exist on this earth anymore. We just begun to see, in a sense, that starting. And Jesus is saying to us in this passage, get ready for it. Get ready. Are you ready to be hated simply because you love Jesus? You see, the first things we, we read, that, that first section almost, we can't do much about it. Wars are going to come. People are going to rise up against different people. But the second bit, specifically from verse 10 and carrying on, because you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. I'm not quite so excited I am about that one yet. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. I'm a little bit more excited about that than the first sentence. Many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. False prophets will arise so that sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. On these bits, there is something we can do about. So this morning, I'm actually wanting us to think a little bit, how do I keep my love warm? I'm not speaking about romantic relationship, husband and wife, that's for Ross and Yaku on a marriage seminar that's coming up. I'm talking about here what the Bible talks about. The love of many will grow cold. God, is there something I can do to help that when I find myself in this situation, if I today was in Kiev as an example, how can I make sure my love does not grow cold? What is it that I can do going into this world at some stage? Maybe during my lifetime, maybe not. But if we enter into this world in my lifetime, Jesus, how can I make sure my love does not grow cold? How can I make sure that, as he says here beforehand, many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other? God, how can I be one who does not turn away from you, who does not betray and hate one another? How do I keep my love warm? And isn't that the beauty of the church? The church is different. We aren't different because we try and look around, what is the world doing and how can we be different on purpose? It's going to be weird and wacky because the world is doing this and I want to be different because Jesus is different. No, Jesus is different. That when the world comes in and hates, Jesus comes in and loves. When the world comes to take and to kill, to steal and to destroy, Jesus comes to give life and life in abundance. When the world says an eye for an eye, Jesus comes to say, love your enemy. Pray for and bless those who persecute you. It is just following Jesus is different to the world. And so how can we keep following Jesus in a sense a world where cancel culture is going to become the prevailing thing? Somebody is different to me, so I must wipe them out. Just as an aside, this whole Cancel culture runs against everything that we see in the gospel because everything I see in the gospel is a grace culture. Is God not wiping me out but because I'm different, but extending grace to me because I'm different? And if someone disagrees with me rather than me trying to wipe them off the face of the planet, how about me extending grace to them as Christ has extended grace to me because of my sin? Whether I was right or wrong, Christ extended, in this conversation, Christ extended grace to me, so maybe I can extend grace to them. I don't have to cancel them. I can love them. Many are going to turn away from God, this scripture says. Many are going to. If I had to guess, if I had to sort of think about possibly why would it be, I think we turn away from God because we don't have a healthy honest understanding and expectation of who He is. If we are following Him, there's a beautiful story kind of we use in some of our evangelism training techniques. That if we go up to somebody and you say, hey, follow Jesus because He's going to make your life better. That's a little bit like saying to somebody, put on this parachute because it's going to make your journey on the airplane more comfortable. No, the chances are half an hour in, this parachute's actually a little bit uncomfortable right now. I can't 
lie down as comfortably. You know, the seat is already a little bit small, so let me just take the parachute off. If we understand this airplane might fall at any moment, it's a little bit rickety. We don't know when it was serviced, and at some stage, you might very well have to jump out of this airplane. So here's a parachute for you. And we get onto that same airplane. Oh, this is really uncomfortable, but I actually don't care. At some stage, I'm going to need that, and I'm willing to go through the uncomfortableness because of the need and the function that the parachute will fulfill at a later stage in this flight. And so if we're saying to G people, come to Jesus because it's comfortable to follow Jesus. He's going to make your life better and nicer. He's going to give you a big car, a big house, a pretty wife. He's going to give you your dreams and your desires. And that's why we're following Jesus. And this happens. Then guess what? I'm probably going to find myself without a parachute very quickly. Because Jesus isn't making it comfortable right now. He's not making it nicer. He's not making it better. And yet, I think if we have a healthy expectation of who He is, of what He does, of expectation of this world and the times that are to come, we enter hopefully into a moment like this. We recognize the season for what it is, and we continue to relate to God correctly. He goes on and he says, not only will we turn away from him, and this is actually what I wanted to speak about. And as I started preparing, I realized there's way too much to say. So we might get to this in a couple of time, days' time, a couple of weeks' time. But he says, they will betray one another and hate one another. And I can't imagine anything worse happening to the body of Christ than this bit right here. I think when Jesus is saying this, I'm seeing a little tear in his eye as he shares this. When Jesus prays for you and me as his followers, the last prayer, in a sense, that he prays, his last night before he's about to be killed on the cross, he goes up and he prays. And what is the one thing he prays? He says, God, keep them together as one. Father, as you and I are one, keep them one. And yet here he says that in these last days, People are going to betray one another. They're going to hate one another. He's not only here. Within the context, we saw that he's not speaking about random people. He's speaking about followers of Jesus. People who would call themselves Christians. And one of the things that I want to hold before us, and this is actually what I wanted to speak about, is how do we disagree with one another? Can we learn to disagree well? There are so many topics during the rounds today. Russia, Ukraine. One, what if we disagree? What if you sit on, one that, on that side of the fence and I sit on this side of the fence and we both follow Jesus? And you believe invasion is right or wrong and the other one believes opposite to you. What is our response? Are we going to cut them off? Are we going to say because you think different, you experience a situation different, I'm going to cancel you, I'm going to betray you, because here's the challenge. This is only going to escalate. Vaccine, not vaccine. School, homeschool. So we can carry on. Situation after t television, not television. Situations are going to get worse and over and over. We can think of more and more. And this week, it was this last year, it was Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. Well, whichever side we sat on it, are we able as Christians to take hands, to come together, and to find ways to disagree well? Or does it bring to a place where we begin to hate one another? In other words, is this other thing that we've, is this a stronger bond or a stronger division than the blood of Christ? Or is the blood of Christ a stronger bond than the division around the topics? So here we have an example. We have a, a Russian military commander and a Ukrainian military commander both saying they follow Jesus. How do we reconcile that? And how are you and I, how are we preparing ourselves knowing that day 
is coming, the day is coming when there is going to be a brother or a sister who perhaps right now is sitting next to me, in front of me, behind me. We are going to disagree about something which is very near to my heart. And what am I going to do in that moment? Am I going to try and counsel them? Or am I going to grace them, if you'd excuse the language? <laughs> Am I going to say, you are not allowed to be in church with me. I can't sit next to you. I can't. So I'm not here talking about things that Scripture clearly talks about as being sinful. There's this place even where Paul says, and he says, I'm not talking about Christians who do these actions. Don't spend time with them. We're talking about here, we have different views on matters which Scripture is unclear about. And then what are we going to do? Well, are we going to say, listen, you and I, disagree 100% about this topic, but come here, sit next to me. I want to worship with you. I want to pray with you. I want us to grow in love and in grace because I don't want to be one day in a situation where the clock has ticked over and we're in where Jesus says here, the end is coming. I don't want to be of the type who's going to betray my brother and hate one another. I want to have learned to love well, to disagree well, to even if we don't, not on the same page around this topic, we're on the same page that Jesus is coming, that He has risen from the grave. And that supersedes everything else. Some of us may have read about the trucker protests in Canada. Tens of thousands of truckers drove into the middle of their capital city and basically shut down the whole capital city for three weeks. The governor of that's, that area is Ontario, and the governor there is a man by the name of Doug Ford. And I was reading up a couple of weeks ago about when this was all happening, and just staying up to date with this, and I, I saw this quote. Ontario Premier Doug Ford from um, CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, acknowledged the vision in his family over COVID-19 restrictions at the same time as he announced his governance plan for ending the province's vaccine passport. And watch this quote. The pandemic has fractured us as a society with differing views about vaccines. Now, this isn't a Christian that is necessary. I don't know if he's a Christian or not. This isn't a guy who's speaking from a position of faith. This isn't an expert. He's not a philosopher. He's not making a comment sort of from as a professor about the state of sociology. He is just saying, this is my experience within the place where I lead and my family. That's all he's saying. He's saying this pandemic has fractured us as a society with differing views about vaccines, public health measures, and personal freedoms, Ford said during his news conference on Monday. All of it has polarized us in a way that we could never have imagined. Ford continued reading from prepared remarks. I've experienced this in my own family. It's been one of the hardest things my family and I have ever gone through. Here is simply the experience of somebody wrestling with one of the realities of our time. And as these disagreements are going to escalate, as the world is going to become more polarized, how are you and I, as the church, going to respond? If I'm pro-vaccine and the person next to me is anti-vaccine or whatever it is, right or wrong, in that context, and this is what I want us to hear, is not the point. Jesus didn't pray, God, I pray that you would, Father, I pray that you would all keep them in a mutual understanding and they would all believe and think the same thing about everything. That's not what he prayed. He prayed that he would keep them in unity. Some of us still have to learn that unity doesn't always acquire agreement. We can disagree and still be in unity. We can disagree and still say, I've got your back. We can disagree and still say, okay, let's find a way of compromise how we can take this forward because we don't agree. And I think anyone who's ever been ma who's married for like perhaps a little bit longer only than Helga and Vainan, maybe they've even discovered this. We're not going to agree about everything, but that doesn't mean we can't be in unity about everything. We can find a way to, to establish unity, to take hands 
to build together. And this is the skill, this is the trick, this is what we are going to have to trust the Holy Spirit to empower us to do. How do we do that in the various circumstances? How do we put love, loving our brother, loving our neighbor, over being right or being wrong? Phrase differently. How do I keep my love warm in the times that potentially are coming? I think this is one of the reasons why something like fellowship is so important. We're not going to learn to disagree well if we never have anyone to disagree with. We're not going to learn to talk through, to respectfully listen to somebody else's point of view, gain a point of their understanding if we never have somebody who has a different understanding. One of the reasons why for me small group is so important isn't that I can't think of a better environment on this earth for us to learn to disagree well than in a place that's such as a small group where we can come together, we can worship together, we can pray together, we can study the word together, and in grace and in love, we can have differing views, but I can learn to listen well. There's a group of people that can help me to understand what I'm not hearing they can help me to communicate what I'm not communicating. Well, it's such a beautiful environment for that. Jesus' final prayer for us was one of unity. You and I, as we prepare a time for a time such as this, are we willing to say, God, I want to fight for unity within the body of Christ above all else? God, I'm, I'm willing to find places of unity with people with whom I disagree. It doesn't mean I'm changing my view, but it means I'm not putting my view above yours. We're wrestling with just as a church, just doctrinally with some of these things right now again. Just we need to bring out some policy pa statements around specific questions. And I remember I said to the guys the other day, listen, can we just be honest with one another for a moment here? Better theologians than us for centuries have studied these same texts and still don't agree. Let's be honest, we are probably not all going to read the same text and agree. We're talking about things like divorce and remarriage. What does Scripture say about that? Because Scripture does say quite a bit, and a whole bunch of people have looked at that. And are we willing to create space to disagree but still be in unity? Are we willing to create space to say, this is what I believe, this is what I understand what you believe, you are welcome to believe that. In a sense, I will support you in your belief, but I'm going to believe this. Because that doesn't change anything about the fact that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave and is coming back again. Which is far more important than how we determine that one specific word, which is a little bit unclear. Of, we don't know exactly if Jesus was standing here today, what he would say. Because scholars throughout the ages have studied this, and none of them can give us a definitive answer and questions like that. And then he ends that passage. He says, it's going to get really rough. And this is, once again, the beauty of the difference of the gospel. He says, but because it's getting rough, the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that the nations will hear it, and then will the end come. So what's going to be happening? People are going to be hating Christians, killing them, persecuting them. They're going to be turning on one another, betraying and hating each other. And somehow, in God's crazy way, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the midst of all of that, this good news will be preached in all of the nations. So we've been preparing ourselves right now. I'm beginning to pray. And fortunately, my wife isn't here right now. God, how do I get to Ukraine? God, how do we get to Russia? There aren't any flights into Russia right now. And the problem is if you get into Russia, you don't know if you're getting out. <laughs> How do I get into Ukraine? And the problem is if I get into Ukraine right now, I don't know if I get out alive. But if I'm reading this in the midst of all of this, there's going to be an opportunity for the gospel as we've never seen before. How prepared are we for those opportunities? How expectant are we? Lord Jesus, come! But I also know if you come there's some stuff we're going to have to go through. I want to be in heaven. I can't wait to be in heaven. 
but there's some stuff I'm going to have to go through to get there. Pain, heartache, hurt. There's a, a similar passage in, in 2 Timothy where Paul and sort of the whole almost book of Timothy is writing, Paul is writing to this young, younger man called Timothy. It's his second letter. There are probably quite a few years between the two letters. And Paul is a father writing here. And if you go and read the whole letter, he's actually preparing Timothy for time to come throughout the whole letter. And we're going to read the whole of chapter 3 this, this morning. And I'll try and be reasonably quick about this. He says, Timothy, you should know this. In the last days, there will be very difficult times. Today, I want to say to you sitting here, you should know this. In the last days, there will be very difficult times. They will be there. We can pray and fast about that as much as we want. We're not going to change that. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from the people like that. The people like that are those who say they are Christians, but they reject the power of what will make them live as Christians. The Bible says that's not who we want to be associating with. And so, here in a sense is a list. We don't have close to enough time today, but if you want to do some Bible study in this week, here's a great one to do. Take 2 Timothy chapter 3, the first nine, or the first, what have I got there? The first five verses. Make bullet points. Bullet point number one. Love only myself. Bullet point number two. Love my money. Bullet point number three. Boastful. Bullet point number four. Proud. Bullet point number five. Scoffing at God. Disobedient to parents. Ungrateful. Consider nothing sacred. Write down all of those things. And say, God, these are the signs of the times. This is what people are going to be. But God, how do I not be that? God, how do I actively counter the spirit of this age that's going to drive people to these things? God, because your spirit, this is not where your spirit is leading us. So all of these things, maybe some of them the Holy Spirit's going to say, no, you're pretty much quite okay on that. You've really learned to love others. You don't only love yourself. You can always grow in that, but, but well done, good and faithful servant in that area. And maybe there's going to be another one that as you write it down, it's like your fingers are going to burn. You know, it's like, ooh, this one hurts. Holy Spirit, help me to grow here. Help me to prepare for a time that is coming. Because if I'm not deliberately taking action against what this enemy spirit wants to establish in my life, guess what? He's going to come in like a flood. If I'm not putting walls up around my city, then any invader can come in. But if I know that these are the invaders, in a sense, these are the missiles that the enemy is going to want to shoot at my heart, how do I make sure that they don't find a space within my heart? Take them. Christian life is different. That's going to be what's going to dictate the way of the world. My question is, what is you and I, what are we going to look like in the end times? Right now, personally, I am far less interested in what the world is going to look like in the end times. I'm far less interested in what is the mark of the beast and what is not the mark of the beast. Just as an aside, just read like a chapter or two before that. And the Bible says, you will be marked by the Spirit of the Lord. So if you've received the mark of God, don't worry, you won't receive the mark of the beast. Okay, It's not like this little thing that the enemy is going to try and sneak in and catch us all off guard because we're not conspiracy theory enough to see the mark of the beast. I'm far less concerned about all of that stuff, about the end times, the airy fairiness. I'm a lot more concerned about what are we as a church going to look like in the end times? How are we going to behave in the end times? How are we going to deal with hardship and pain and suffering? And then I'm so encouraged 
by the stories that are coming through from the church in Ukraine about how believers are standing up and loving their neighbor in the midst of hardship. What that looks like for them. And then my question comes back to my heart. What would I do? Would I do what they are doing? Because I want to grow to a point where I would. Are you willing not only to be, to look different, to think different, to be different, to work differently to the ways of the world? And then in verse 10, Paul's carrying on. He's speaking as a father to his son. He says, but you, Timothy, know what I teach and how I live. So I want to just highlight again these passages, the two sections we're going to read now. They follow on the first section. Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, Timothy, in the last days, this is what the world is going to look like. He mentions all of those characteristics that's going to define the world. Then he says they're going to be false prophets. We didn't get into that. Uh, that is there. It's important. But in the context where we are now today, we're not going to spend time on that. So he says this is what it's going to look like. With all of that as a background, he says, but you, Timothy, he's bringing a contrast. He's saying, this is the world, but you, Timothy, know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from it all. Yes. Once again, can I have my warning sign flash up again? Uncomfortable words ahead. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil people and imposters will flourish. That's going to be frustrating, isn't it? The evil people, those imposters, they're flourishing in this world and are being persecuted. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. And so Paul writes to Timothy here, and I want to hold this before us. As believers, Paul says, Timothy, my life is telling you who God is and what Christian life looks like. Timothy, you know me. You know my life. You know my conduct. You know how I've handled myself in hardship, in persecution. Timothy, I've been an example and then it comes back to you and me. What example are you and I being to other believers? What is our life saying to other people about what Christianity looks like? When I find myself in persecution and hardship, do I conduct myself in a way that other people are going to look at that and say, one day, when I'm going through persecution, I want to deal with it like Rob dealt with it. When I find myself in a hard spot, I want to deal with that hard spot like Bonnie dealt with that hard spot she was in. Is that how we are living our lives? Are we able to write a letter to the people who are looking at us and saying, but young person, know what I teach. You know what I teach. You know how I live. You know what my purpose in life is. You've seen how I've conducted myself. That's an example to you. It's interesting, it's so, so interesting to me. If you look at eldership in Scripture, once again, it's one of those things where a whole bunch of people have different views because the reality is the Bible really doesn't say very much about eldership. There's no job description for what elders must do. But the, what the Bible is very clear about is what elders must be. And what they must be is an example. Before anything else, they must be an example of what it looks like to follow Jesus. All of the requirements, if you go and read about eldership, they all say this is how the person must look in terms of their lifestyle, their orientation, the stuff that's important to them, their character. Those are all of the things that the Bible tells us elders must be. What they must do, and by the way, they could probably do a couple of things. That's how it's written. And we so get focused in modern church about what the elder must do, and we completely miss it. The text says the elder must be an example. And that is why the who an elder is is far more important than what the elder does. Because other people must be able to look up at the elder and say, that is what it looks like 
to follow Jesus. So what is our life telling, not only in an evangelistic sense, but to other believers? What is our life telling people about what it looks like to follow Jesus? So Paul's written all of this. He said, hard times are coming. There's going to be a bunch of chaos. But I have been an example to you, Timothy. Take heart from my example in the chaos. And then he carries on in verse 14. And he says, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. So you must follow my example and what you've been taught. You know they are true. For you know who, for you know you can trust those who taught you. And the reason he can trust those who taught him is because it was his grandmother and his mother. And Paul, and to some extent as well, that came through in some of the other letters. You know you can trust them. You've seen the effect of it on their lives. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. We love, especially this next verse, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. We love reading. I love reading that scripture totally out of context. Verse 16, by itself, all scripture is given for all of these great things. But I think it adds so much more value when we see Paul is writing this to Timothy. He says, in the last times, the last days, all of this is going to be happening. What is your map that you navigate these rough seas well? It's the Word of God. When the wheels start falling off, guess what? All of Scripture has been given to show you what is right, to teach you what is wrong. All of Scripture has been given within the context of this chaotic world that awaits us at some stage. I think this applies in an unchaotic world as well. Not that the world is completely unchaotic, but you guys get where I'm at as well. That this passage applies. But in this world going forward, here is a life-giving map to navigate those rough seas, to navigate the storm that is ahead. And then my question comes back to here where you are today, in which I don't think is this type of environment where Jesus is talking about here, nations rising against nations, kingdom against kingdoms, hardship and persecution us at least in South Africa, we're not there yet. But am I prepared for that? Am I prepared relationally? Am I prepared to be able to deal with conflict in a good, healthy Christian way? Am I able to disagree with somebody in a way that I don't have a need to counsel them, but I actually respect their opinion, their view? I disagree with their view, but I respect their view. Have I learned that skill, that ability? And then do I know the Word? Am I able to read, to apply the Word well? Maybe even right up at this Bible school starting in a couple of weeks. It's not an extra nice-to-have thing which we do maybe because it will improve your Christian life. We do it as a fundamental ministry to ground us as followers of Jesus. I would hate to have any believer step into this moment. Because in the section we cut out here, Paul says, pray that it's not at night. Or even worse, that you are not pregnant in this time. It's going to be rough. It's going to be hard. The, hard. the worst thing that I can imagine is that one of us would go in there unprepared because we didn't take time to learn the Word, to study the Word. Bible school helps with that, but Bible school, if you've done Bible school, you know, we're not finished learning, reading, studying, growing in the Word. Bible school is just, in a sense, a starter. It, it helps us to understand well, to be taught the Word. You see, I love this about Timothy. Timothy didn't just read the Word and figure it all out himself. He was taught the Word. Let me put that plug in there. Bible school isn't just a nice-to-have, luxurious extra, which some believers get to do. It is something we all need to do for a variety of different reasons. Today's message being one of them. Am I going to have a map to help me navigate the storm? 
It might come at some stage in my life. It might not. It might very well be we all get to a end of the age, beautiful, peaceful world that we live in largely continues. And for age of prosperity and stock markets are just up and job creation is just up and agriculture is up and everybody is just happy and smiling and it's beautiful. It might be. It might also not be. And how equipped are we to deal with a not be? And that's the challenge that I want to leave with us. When we read these uncomfortable words, do we walk out of here today saying, our oh Lord Jesus, come. I can't wait for it. Or are we, our oh Lord Jesus, come, but not yet. I'm, I'm not ready. I need to be taking steps to prepare because Jesus is coming. And when he comes, I don't want to be like one of the foolish virgins. I want to be one of the wise virgins. What is the difference between the foolish and the wise in that context? The wise were prepared. The foolish were unprepared. And just as an aside, I'm going to throw this in there as well. Sometimes we miss this. The foolish had run out of their well. So it's the story, the ten virgins, they're waiting for a bridegroom to come. Exactly the story we're seeing here. They're waiting for the return of the bridegroom. They have the little lamps. Some of them brought extra oil. Some of them didn't bring extra oil. Those who didn't bring extra oil, the five of them, their oil is finished. The other five have extra oil. The foolish ones who didn't bring extra oil, they look to the five who did bring extra oil, and they say, please give us some of yours. What is the Christian response in that moment? No. We love thinking that sometimes it's just the other person's because they've got, they must give to me. But the Bible says the wise did not do that. I'm not saying don't be generous. I'm not saying don't be given. It's not, a, if you heard that in what I said, it's not at all what I'm saying. Be generous. Be abundantly generous. Give as much as you possibly can. I, I try and make that my prayer. I'm not always good at it, but I don't want to pray how little can I give. I want to pray how much can I give. Make that your prayer. How much can I give? But there is a time, there is a place where wisdom says now is not the time to give what I've got. We see that with those virgins. And it's so important for you and me that we prepare ourselves well. We prepared relationally. We prepared spiritually. We prepared theologically. So we have an expectation that if bombs start falling, if nation turns against nation, if people start hating, persecuting, judging me, I'm not going to turn my back on God because I have a healthy understanding of who He is and what He does. And I can represent Him well in those circumstances. Can we stand this morning? I want us to pray.